Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia Castellanos. Uh, before diving in, I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Torrance and the YWCA of the Harbor area for hosting this candidates forum tonight. Um, I am born and raised in the district. I was raised in Carson and currently live in San Pedro. I am the only candidate for LA Unified School Board District 7, supported by United Teachers Los Angeles, Education Workers United, Mayor Eric Garcetti, and the Democratic Party. I'm running for school board because I believe we can do better for our children and improve their opportunity for a bright future. As a parent of a second grader, that's attending LAUSD, I'm concerned for the future. If you elect me, I would be the only parent of a current LAUSD student on the school board. Parents, we de deserve a voice on the school board and I would be honored to serve. As a workforce deputy, community organizer and advocate, I have the experience and background to stand up for our children. I know what kind of education is needed for the jobs of the future, and I've led successful fights to protect students from air pollution from our ports and to create opportunities for them and their families. Most important, I co-founded Reclaim Our Schools LA, a coalition of parents, students, teachers, school staff and neighbors across the district. I led the effort to build grassroots support for our schools so we can secure more education funding and secure the frontline supports that our students need. California is near the bottom of the list in per pupil spending, and that has to change. We need smaller class sizes for students to get the individual attention from educators they deserve. Our students need nurses, counselors, and librarians at every campus. And as it has become so evident during the COVID pandemic, we need to close the technology gap so that students from working families have the opportunities for achievement. And speaking of COVID, as a working parent, I want to express that I have firsthand experience with distance learning and I know it's hard. I appreciate the challenges so many families like us are facing and I look forward to a healthy return to campuses as soon as it's safe. I've heard from so many other parents and I know that together we will strengthen our schools. Thank you. Thank you. And now Ms. Franklin. Thank you all so much for hosting tonight and for participating and you know it's really an important opportunity for civic engagement. I'm Tanya Ortiz Franklin and I'm running for school board in the district where I was a student, a middle school teacher and have been working to improve public schools my entire career. After graduating from Narbonne High School in District 7 and Columbia University, I was a classroom teacher at Stephen White Middle School in Carson for five years. I earned my master's in elementary education and I taught sixth grade English and history, which meant my primary goal was to help my students improve their reading, writing, and critical analysis skills so that upon graduation from high school, they could choose anywhere they wanted to go in the world, ideally college, career, and thrive in life. But I was laid off from LA Unified in 2010 alongside hundreds of other educators that year in the last Great Recession. So I went to UCLA Law for law school, uh, studied public interest law and critical race. And while I was at UCLA Law, I came to the Partnership for LA Schools, a nonprofit that manages 19 traditional district schools, half of which are in District 7. I still look at the partnership to this day and I get to support educators to improve teaching, learning, school culture. And I also get to advocate alongside educators, parents, community partners at the district level for equitable policies and practices around school funding and school safety. I'm running for school board in my home community because every student, and especially those who have been most historically marginalized, deserve education leaders who will always put them first so that they can graduate fully prepared to thrive in college, career, and life. That's exactly what I've been able to do as an educator and an advocate within and alongside LA Unified for the last 15 years, and it's how I'll continue to dedicate my life. I look forward to getting into the issues tonight, and I really appreciate you all so much for being here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, so question first is actually going to go to Ms. Franklin, as I said in the beginning that some of you out there in the world will not hear that part. Um, we are going to circle through the questions so a different candidate will answer first each time and that way you're not always in the hot seat and you're not always last. So Ms. Franklin, you're going to take the first question, um, which is 
how do you plan to engage with parents from your school board position? No worries at all. Thank you for the question. Parent engagement is particularly important, particularly since I'm not yet a parent myself. I uh, plan to make it a priority to communicate with families about what's happening in their classroom, their schools, and across the district. You know, I think LA Unified has a long history of needing to do a little better with community engagement and particularly listening to the voices of our parents. So often we talk at parents or maybe we ask for a survey, but we don't engage in two-way dialogue where we're really discussing the issues, potentially disagreeing on things, but trying to serve our children collectively to the best of our ability. At my job, I've been able to do listening sessions that I definitely want to continue as a board member, simply asking families what's going well, what's not going as well, and how can I be a better support to you all? I want to continue advisory boards that I've been able to do for the last several years to get real feedback on draft uh, resolutions and ideas and make sure that parents always have a seat in official capacities, but also in informal capacities to make sure we're serving their kids together. Thanks for the question. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos. Hi, thank you for the question. That is, uh, parent engagement is one of my top priorities, um, both as a candidate and it, it will be as a school board member. As an organizer and advocate, I've spent decades engaging families and parents about the issues that are affecting their families and their communities. And I intend to bring the model of organizing into uh, the school board. I think there are, we have a long way to go to meaningfully engage parents and provide opportunities for them to, to, uh, to give their input and access, not just access information, but also know how to navigate the big bureaucracy that is LAUSD. Unfortunately, we need to be able to break that down so that parents can better advocate for their for their students, for their children. I got to say, even during the primary, in the many doors that I knocked and coming across many families and many parents, especially parents of special ed students that felt so marginalized and isolated in trying to access services for their students, we need to make that easier for them. And I intend to uh, invest resources into making making sure we're creating those mechanisms for parents to access those services. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And our next question, of course, now, um, Ms. Castellanos, you're going to go first. It's well known that minority students are falling behind in LAUSD schools. Why do you think that is and how do you plan to change this? Um, this is, I, I, yes, that that is very true and there is a long history uh, across the district and especially in high needs communities and black and brown communities across the district to strip resources away from our schools and from other social services that our families need. Um, this is, you know, part and parcel with the 30, 40 years of state dis you know, disinvestment of stripping away resources from education at the state level and at the local level. I think the LAUSD has made some progress. Um, the board by adopting the student equity needs index um, to be able to better distribute resources to the highest need schools. We need to continue to do that. We need to make sure that our administrators at the schools have the ability to draw down the resources that their students and their schools need. And so we need to be able to provide those supports for the administrators, for the parents, again, to advocate for those resources and to better assess the particular and unique needs of, of schools and the students at individual schools across the district. Thank you. And now, Ms. Franklin, this is your turn for this question. Thank you. You know, schools are not exempt from the history of this country of white supremacy, institutionalized and interpersonal racism. And we are at a national reckoning with that fact. And we need to address it. Yes, absolutely. With resources and also with our curriculum. We need to make sure that our BIPOC, our black indigenous students of color are celebrated in the curriculum and not just in history, but in science and math. So our students can see their futures after they graduate. We need to interact interact with students and with families in culturally responsive ways. And lots of times, I know this because of my experience in working alongside school staff, we have the best of intentions, but sometimes the conversations are not quite in sync and we might be insensitive or not speaking the same language to try to serve our students collectively together. And so being an educator of teachers with teachers, so much of that learning happens when we're together. 
sitting in circle, practicing new skills, getting feedback on how our interactions are going with students and families because racism is institutionalized and we need to work on that, but also we need to work on our interpersonal relationships. Okay, thank you. And so the next question is yours to go first. What has your experience with distance learning been and what is your plan to improve it for the families that struggle with it every day? Ooh, yes. <laughs> um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I was helping with our food distribution and our technology distribution. Same thing at the beginning of this school year. And, you know, our superintendent said something like 7,000 kids have still not yet connected. And, and the first point is to absolutely have access with technology and stable internet. We know our families in lower income communities don't always have that stable access. Um, I haven't seen it very much. I've seen a few classrooms and a few students from the family perspective, and my heart absolutely goes out to all of the classroom teachers, all of the parents who are in it day after day. I think they are finding the best solutions. We should be as localized as possible when figuring out what successes to scale and what barriers to remove. So where parents have been able to tell their teachers what their students' strengths are, that's where the real success happens. Where teachers are collaborating with each other and finding good solutions for curriculum, those are the kinds of things we should really be honing in on. Not necessarily district, um, you know, lockstep professional development across the entire district, but really getting localized for individual students and campuses. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos. Um, I could spend the whole evening talking to you about my experience with distance learning, uh, but I have a minute. So let me try to use it judiciously. Again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I am at home uh, supporting my daughter through distance learning uh, in, in second grade, and it is incredibly challenging and experienced my first uh, virtual back at school um, uh, night. And I got to tell you, everyone from parents to teachers are trying their best. Everyone is putting the best foot forward and also really um, worn out by the experience. So it is trying for everyone. I think everyone is really uh, hopeful that at some point soon we can return safely to schools. But until then, there are a few things that do need to happen. Um, you know, the technology, access to technology has been an ongoing challenge. I think the, you know, we need to push uh, at every level for universal broadband access uh, for communities that don't currently have access to it. The other, we need to provide better supports for families, especially working families and um, non-English speaking families to be able to support their children in distance learning. And so we need to be able to provide more resources and more training for those families. And many times it's grandmothers um, that are at home with their children and there's multi-generational homes. And so we need to better support those families. Thank you. Thank you. And so you actually get the next question first again. So um, how will LAUSD implement the new California requirement to track student career pathway achievement after high school graduation? Uh, this is um, a real, yeah, I have a firsthand experience with tracking career achievement from the workforce development side on the county side, and I have to tell you this is a challenge, and so we will need to uh, partner with multiple agencies um, to be able to track them, and there are, you know, confidential confidentiality laws, there's everything. But I do think that we need to make sure that we bring together, um, you know, our, our uh, internal and um, LAUSD departments um, to be able to track that along with, there's the state EDD, our college, um, you know, track them through colleges. Um, and there are various resources out there, researchers that are able to track this. And I know it's been, it's been an ongoing struggle um, many years in the making at the county and so this is not going to be an easy task um, but I think we do need to you know find out uh, what the achievement level of our students is beyond uh, 12th grade. Okay great thank you. Uh, Ms. Franklin what are your thoughts on that? I agree, the data systems will be huge and it's complex, but not impossible. We have done great things as a state of California before and we can absolutely do it again. 
you know, there are a few charter schools that do this and spend a lot of money doing it that the public likely could not, but we can try to learn what they have found to be successful. And one prediction I have is that relationships with your home high school would be really helpful for understanding where students go and are successful in college and in career. You know, I still love going to Narvon's homecoming when possible, and I'd be happy to fill out a survey for them, letting them know where I had went to college, what my experience was like, and what my career path has been since. I think if we maintain those really strong relationships from early childhood through adult education and LA Unified, we could gather some of that information ourselves, and we should also be exploring some of the data systems across the state, across the county. Okay, thank you. And so you actually get to go first on the next one. So here we go. Have you received donations from a union, a company, a wealthy person? <laughs> Any of the above. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you know, that's when, that's been one of the hardest parts about being a first-time candidate is the fundraising aspect. You know, most of my um, contributors are, are friends and family members who are educators, nonprofit lawyers, and asking someone for $25, $50 the first time is, is really hard. Um, part of what the, the great idea of having a campaign team is, is to be able to build relationships and connect with folks who care about public education in so many ways. Um, and so, yes, it's been, you know, wonderful to get to connect with folks and talk with them about what matters to them and that they see something in me and my campaign that they would directly contribute to. Of course, only up to $1,200 is the maximum contribution for our campaigns. Um, I wonder if the question was asking about outside spending, which is a completely different ballgame um, and completely disheartening when we spend so much time working so hard to raise the small amounts that we can to get our message out out there um, and then folks who have a lot more resources um, can send their own message out there separate from the campaigns. Mm. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos. Um, yes and uh, you know as uh, as was already mentioned this is an unfortunate part of campaigning um, and you know and a very challenging one and I think you know not within our immediate control, but certainly would support along with others uh, reforming our campaign finance laws to make sure that we can, you know, get real people uh, that have experience and have the, the best intentions uh, for our communities at every level of government and give them a real viable chance at representing uh, again, our communities at, at every level, uh, school board, city, county, et cetera, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so you go first on the next question, and where is it? Oh, here we go. So what are your thoughts on charter schools? And Ms. Castellanos, you're gonna go first. It took me a minute to realize uh, I was next. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the my opinion my opinion on charter schools i think uh you know the, the charter law as it originally was conceived i think we've we've gone we've strayed quite a bit from the original intention of having charter schools be the laboratory um for all of our schools and for education and experiment with different strategies that then we can bring back into our neighborhood schools i don't think we're doing that anymore. I think the, the number of charter schools has just exploded and has created a competition for our students and has, you know, taken resources away from our neighborhood schools. Um, that said, we are, we now are operating under new laws in the state of California and laws that the school board is implementing to make sure that we are holding charter schools accountable to high standards um, and to make sure that they, you know, there's not over concentrations of them, that they're not having a, a, a negative impact on our neighborhood schools. But fundamentally, my priority is to invest in our neighborhood schools to make sure that they become a top choice and a, 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 yeah, a top choice for our families in our neighborhoods. Thank you. And Ms. Franklin, what are your thoughts? 
You know, and as diverse a district as LA Unified, I support having good school choices for all families. As mentioned, I'm not yet a parent, and I can only imagine how hard that choice is to make a decision about where your child will spend their educational journey. Um, In District 7, we have about 120 traditional schools and 30 charter schools. Across the district, about 20% of kids and families have chosen charter schools. And part of what I want to understand is what has uh, created that choice, what has led families to choose different options. You know, I myself went to a magnet school in LA Unified. I have friends with kids in dual language programs or at pilot schools that have some flexibilities. And we can absolutely be learning across all of these different school models. But charter schools, of course, are slightly different because they have a different governing body and are held to public accountability and transparency that we absolutely have to maintain with the implementation of AB 1505. Um, And as, as was mentioned, the first thing we need to do is focus on teaching and learning and the best practices possible for our kids and make sure that every school is a great school for every child. Thank you. Um, And now you take the next question uh, first, uh, Ms. Franklin. How can we assure that high school graduates are work ready? You know, it's a great question that I think is different depending on each student and what their interests are. Um, Lots of schools are thinking about internships and linked learning so that students have hands-on experiences while they're still in high school. You know, tons of schools for years have had um, extracurricular programs that often turn out to be students' most exciting passion, whether it's leadership, the arts, or athletics. And I think we need to hone those skills and really provide students opportunities to explore their careers in all of the different possibilities. I'm a big fan of making sure every child can choose the great public universities in California. Go UCLA, number one. I'm an alum. Um, And that requires, yes, A through G passage at C or better. And we understand not every kid will choose college. And they need the experience in high school to figure out what is their next best step and what does that feel like. Um, So I'm a big fan of linked learning. I'm a big fan of supporting the arts and different programs that can help students really try on what their career might be like before they graduate. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos, what are your thoughts? Um, This is one of my areas of strength. I mean, I've spent many years looking at what are the the career paths that lead to success for for people across the county, for our LA residents. And I think, you know, what we need to look at is providing more opportunities for career exploration at the high school level, partnering with other stakeholders, whether it be Uh, business sectors, growth sectors in the economy, um, unions that are providing a training in those sectors or across sectors, and looking at potentially forming models for pre-apprenticeships across those growth sectors and making sure that our students are career ready once they graduate if they choose not to go to college. And, you know, we want them to be able to land at a, at, a, at a place, whether it be an apprenticeship or an entry-level position that we know has a path to a middle-class or better career. Thank you. So you get to get, go first on the next question. Are you ready? So with the, re- and that would be you, Ms. Castellano. <laughs> the next question is, with the reduction in the school police budget, what actions will you take to ensure that school campuses are safe and that schools are prepared to respond to active shooters. That's really interesting. I think active shooters is one scenario, uh, probably the, the the most extreme. I would want to sit down with the multiple stakeholders. I know this is something that you know the LAUSD uh, task force is doing right now uh, with school police and others to look at what are the the strategies. And what what are the things that need to be in place to provide safety on a number of levels? One is for the people inside the campuses. I think there are different strategies. We need to make sure that our students are safe at, in, in every way, physical, emotional, and mental. Um, but also, as we've heard recently, it's like the, we also have schools um, that we need to make sure are secure. And that requires a whole other strategy. And so I would want to be... be uh, study, you know, studying, working with uh, our stakeholders to make, to really um, 
explore what those strategies are because they are not the same. And, you know, I think uh, as it relates to an active shooter, it's going to require more than just even at a full budget. LA, LA, you know, LA, LA school police is not going to be sufficient to deal with that, uh, with a problem like that of that level. And so, you know, we need to work together with our local jurisdictions uh, around those instances. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Uh, Franklin, what are your thoughts on this? You know, as unfortunate as it is, the active shooters around the country have often been students who had um, bad experiences on their campuses. And so absolutely, when we think about student safety, we should be spending the vast majority of our time, our dollars, our energy in preventing any sort of harmful situation, whether it's as extreme as this type of situation or even the interactions between students that make them feel unsafe, like Ms. Casiano said, physically, emotionally, or intellectually. And so we do have a lot of thinking to do around our budget and how we invest to reach our goals of real student safety as holistic as it should be. And I just want to invite everyone, we're having a conversation next Wednesday on Zoom to discuss this very issue. It absolutely does have diverse perspectives and we should be hearing from lots of voices about how do we make sure students feel as safe as possible, which again for me is the most localized decision on your campus, in your classroom, with the staff that get to support you? What is it going to take? And at the board level, how do we resource it so that every child feels safe on campus? Okay, thank you. And so you're going to start with this one, Ms. Franklin. Do you feel the school district is a good partner addressing student homelessness? So the last I checked, we had about 20,000 students who were homeless in LA Unified or, or who qualified um, under the broad definition. And I anticipate lots of those students are some of the 7,000 who have not yet connected with school um, in the fall semester. And in this moment, it, it's really hard. There are so many things happening, but they are obviously the students that we should be centering in our decision making. And so we haven't done home visits in LA Unified since the pandemic hit, at least not officially. Many community partners have because they know families are really struggling and particularly those who are experiencing housing instability or insecurity. And so in this moment, I worry that we're not being the best partners that we should be um, to make sure that students' basic needs are being met, but also that their learning needs are being met. Because often school is the great chance to connect with other students and to um, forget about your problems for a little while and focus on your future and what's possible um, beyond the current situation. And so I think there's more we need to do in this moment. And then, of course, long term connecting with lots of partners and make sure our families are housed. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Castellanos. Um, I think the district has a long way to go, actually, to be a good partner on this front. And, you know, I say that being in a number of conversations uh, as a as a public servant in the county, um, as a, a deputy for one of our county supervisors. And, you know, there have been many efforts to try to bring together county services for uh, students and families experiencing homelessness with, uh, with the county. And in some occasions, uh, the district just has not known how to partner to make sure that we we're able to provide those services for students. So I think we need to really look at and uh, shift uh, to a culture of partnership and, you know, looking at other local jurisdictions that have expertise in providing these services to really partner with them. Um, that being said, there have been instances where, you know, the, the school district has worked effectively to try to uh, create transitional or um, yeah, transitional homes for for uh, students experiencing homelessness. And we need to expand that and then uh, move towards permanency. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Castellanos, you go first on this next one. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I keep afraid that throws me off, but yes. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so what is your position on teacher salary increases? Teachers should not need to strike in order to receive wage increases and services for our students. That's absolutely right. Uh, no, no teacher, no employee of LAUSD, especially, I think we all should agree after uh, this pandemic, uh, should have to strike for an increase. I think if nothing more, this experience during the pandemic has showed 
the how valuable our teachers are and the links that they go through to really support and educate and support and provide everything they can to our students. And so I think um, as we look forward, even pre pre COVID, but looking forward, we know we're facing a teacher shortage. If we are trying to attract the 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 best and brightest to our schools to 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 help and support our, our children, we are not going to do it if we're if we're not providing them if we're not valuing them with with salary and the the benefits that they deserve. Um, I think you know we we should at least acknowledge that um, they they deserve and all of our employees at LAUSD deserve a wage and a salary on which they could live uh, sustainably um, and then work together to figure out how we how we meet that need. Thank you. Ms. Franklin, what do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I agree. We should never have to go to such extremes as a strike to be heard. And I shouldn't say we because I wasn't in the classroom at that moment. Um, but teachers deserve a lot more. And compensation is part of it. It's respect. It's the support, the working conditions, um, you know, the professional learning and growth that's possible within the classroom to stay in the classroom. You know, LA Unified has such a culture of promoting out to be able to earn more dollars. And it's ridiculous to me that we have some folks in LA Unified making four times the amount of a starting teacher salary. And we don't talk about this enough. Um, we don't talk about how compensation um, is allocated across all of our different employees. And in large part, I believe it's because we need to deeply examine our budget. We need to say, what is our big goal with our $8 billion? Because we can do a lot, but we can't do everything. And what do we value? And will we make hard choices to really value those that are closest to our kids, and that's absolutely our teachers and our school staff, not the folks who are farthest away in this moment. Okay, thank you. So you go next on the next question, Ms. Franklin. How will you ensure, ensure schools will have the necessary funds when they reopen? Funds to purchase PPEs, basic supplies such as soap, paper towels, toilet paper, disinfecting supplies, as well as additional staff if needed. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I mentioned I was on campus in the beginning when some schools had um, most of the supplies that they needed, what was previously mentioned, um, but it's really hard to practice the protocols to wash your hands and use the hand sanitizer when you're trying to get a family logged onto a computer quickly so they can access learning at home. So yes, it's about getting the dollars to school sites so they can get the things that they absolutely need, but it's also about taking the time to practice the protocols that make sure that we're um, as, as safe and healthy as possible. Um, and so it's not quite as expensive to get soap and hand sanitizer. It's really more um, the, the time it takes to practice these new uh, procedures on campus. Um, let's spend the time paying people to really practice before children come on campus to make sure everyone is very clear. Um, you know, I was a former classroom teacher. You can't just write it on a piece of paper and assume I'm going to implement it the next day. We really need to spend the time I'm practicing with the adults how to use the PPE so that they're ready to show kids when we come back. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos. Yeah, I think in this case, we're we're going to need to push uh, our legislator, le legislators at the federal level to make sure that uh, we have more recovery dollars available uh, for our, our local communities. And in this case, for our schools, the most important, I think, early in the pandemic, um, you know, generally as a society, even as a county, we were so focused on reopening the economy that I think it took us a minute to realize that we can't fully reopen our economy if we have nowhere for our students to go and learn. And that our, I think that shifted the priority to make sure that our first priority has to be, how do we open our schools safely? And that everything else has to be secondary. And so I think now that we have everyone's attention about the critical role of schools in our in our communities, that we need to take advantage of that to draw down more resources. And as Ms. Franklin said, it requires not just the actual materials that we need, but practices and personnel. 
we're going to need more custodial staff to be able to meet the higher standards for cleanliness. We, we're going to need nurses. And so we, we need to draw down more of those resources and fight for them to make sure they come to our schools. Okay, thank you. Um, so you're up next to go first, Ms. Castellanos. And the question is, in the budget, what do you see as the top five priorities? Hmm. I think they all probably, you know, more than five. It, the priority needs to be to draw down our resources to, you know, our local schools. Uh, we need to make sure that our schools, um, and now becomes more important with uh, the protocols and the guidelines for uh, complying with the health officer orders, we need to make sure that we have small classrooms. Um, now more than ever, that's not even a desire or a wish list anymore. It's going to be a necessity. So we're going to need smaller class classroom sizes. And with that, we're going to need more uh, teachers and classroom aides to be able to support that. We're going to need nurses. We need more supports for our students on campuses. Uh, this is pre-COVID and currently everything from libra librarians, counselors, to um, mental mental health um, and uh, psychiatric social workers for our students. And so all, all of that is to say that I think there is one big priority that has many categories under that of getting more resources down to our students and investing in, in the, the teachers and the employees, the, re, the human resources that are gonna support that. Thank you. And Ms. Franklin, what do you think? You know, years ago, our state moved away from all of these different categorical programs because the best decisions are made at the most local level. And so with the local control funding formula, there was a real recognition that there are certain kids who need more personnel, more support. And in LA Unified, about 85% of our kids qualified for uh, one of those three categories, right? English language learners, foster youth, low income students. And we in LA Unified developed a new formula with community that I really think is a model and can help us get to priorities, which is the Student Equity Needs Index. And that is really about resourcing our highest needs schools with a holistic understanding of student need and giving them the power and the flexibility and the support to make the best decisions for the kids that are in front of them. You know, it's almost false to put these um, budget, uh, you know, decisions in, in categories of instruction or operations or social emotional when we know a classroom teacher does all of those things, right? And so in my mind, it is really hard to make um, big decisions at the district about priorities, but we have to think, how do we get the resources to our students and our schools so that they're making the best decisions for the kids they're seeing every day? And they're gonna see how they cross over into these different categories so that kids are learning which should be our first priority and that are safe on campus as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Franklin, you go first on this one. Do you feel the school district is doing enough to attract and retain students from high-income families? Well, that's an area of learning for me. Um, my work has really been um, in South LA and Watts for the last nearly 10 years. And we have been so focused on our students needing additional love and support and resources. Um, and so when I think about District 7 and the diversity of our district, both racially and socioeconomically, um, that's definitely an area that I, I want to learn more about and think about who has chosen schools outside of LA Unified, who is privileged enough to do so. Um, it's it's been interesting texting and calling with um, voters who have said they didn't have faith in LA Unified and chose to pay for private school. That is a really hard choice to make, but if you can afford it, um, that is a, a real challenge to think about what our district could do to make sure that our students, uh, regardless of means, have a great public education within LA Unified. Um, you know, I'm a deep believer in heterogeneous learning, that kids learn great things from each other when they are in mixed environments. And and across the spectrum, if we had more diversity in our own classrooms, not just across the entire school district, but within classrooms, kids could be learning a lot more together. So it's definitely something to look into. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Castellanos, what do you think about that? Likewise, it's not a, a question that I've thought about uh, too often or deeply. I'm, you know, I have been uh, concerned and have prioritized making sure that our, student, our current students have the resources that they need to learn, especially students in highest needs uh, schools and, and communities. Um, and, you know, I think it is also the case that it's not just the more 
affluent students that uh, aren't entering our schools, but even middle class and some low income families that are choosing to send their schools uh, I'm sorry, their student, their children to uh, to other schools. And so I think the, the question really should be, how do we attract more students? How do we develop programs uh, across the district that strengthen the curriculum, that strengthen the services so that families see our neighborhood schools as the choice for their child to go to, or at least a choice on the table. And I think that will draw students from every uh, economic um, every economic level and a racial level as well. Okay, thank you. And so, uh, Ms. Castellanos, you go first on this next question. How can we train enough teachers and administrators of color that reflect the demographics of the students they serve? Um, you know, I think there are some really good programs already. I know here in the Harbor at Harbor College, we have a teacher uh, academy at uh, that is uh, a magnet school in partnership with uh, LAUSD, and so these are student, you know, these are students that are coming straight out of our schools and are exploring a career in teaching. I think, you know, as mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that we are providing a salary uh, and benefits that are appealing and attractive um, to to future teachers. I mean, it, it sadly is the case that many. People that are coming out of college right now, um, both bachelor's degree and even graduate school, are coming out with significant debt. And so unless we offer uh, a competitive salary, we're not going to be able to attract uh, teachers that need to be able to need a, a salary that are, to pay off that debt. And often, you know, I think that um, that affects our, our, our prospective teachers that come from low income and working families um, that need to make sure they're, they're financially stable. Thank you. Ms. Franklin. This is a really important question. It, again, as, as diverse as our district is, about 90% of our students are students of color. And there are many classrooms, many schools um, where kids will not see a teacher that looks like them. And that is not okay. You know, I have worked with schools where there has been one black educator who has said, I have not always felt comfortable or supported or um, seen by the folks on my own very campus, even though folks try to, there is a real need to have more teachers of color. And I would say in particular, black educators and black male educators, there is definitely some work happening around recruitment, but we also have to retain and support, make sure that voices are heard, that people feel that they are important and needed, and they're not tokenized and, um, you know, asked to be the one voice to represent their race, um, but are really a model for students and are also a model for what our students can um, do in in this world, right? Not only break the barriers and be the first, but to have a cadre of leaders of color in LA and across this country is absolutely what we should be working towards. Okay, thank you. So now you go first on the next question, Ms. Franklin, is if there was one thing that you, that you would have cut instead of the school police budget, what would that be? Maybe um, I it again? Are you okay? No, I, I was thinking about the question. Thank you for it. Um, you know, part of it is is the process itself. Um, you know, if I were in a vacuum and had a magic wand and, and wasn't collaborating with others, it would be a very dystopian world um, because I believe we make good decisions together and again, closest to kids. So it's really hard to say where would we just cut $25 million from our district. Um, I do think we need to be more transparent about where we're spending the resources and what is getting us to our goals. You know, honestly, I don't know that we do enough um, progress monitoring of our data to even let us know where we are spending effectively and where we are struggling. And so that would be a decision I, I wouldn't be able to make without more data to really reveal uh, not only the different perspectives across the, in, uh, the district and, and the impact of that program or that, that, um, that investment, um, but I'd, I'd like to understand more quantitative and qualitative data about our investments to make sure that we're not arbitrarily making cuts like that. Um, but it's a good magic wand question to, to really think through what I could do. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Ms. Castellanos, what would you yeah. cut instead of the police? <laughs> I, I think um, we do, you know, it requires a little more uh, 
studying of the budget such as it is, as already mentioned, it's one of the most difficult documents to be able to understand. And, you know, I've uh, read through counties, thir you know, $34 billion budget. And so LAUSD is, is even more challenging than that. And so we need to be able to see where our money is going and also look at those line items or those categories that are ha not having the impact that we want them on our students. Fundamentally, it's about getting the resources to our students to, to make sure that they are, you know, in this case, we're looking for more mental health supports. We're looking for more counselors. And so we need to be able to find that, the, those resources and those investments somewhere in the budget. And I, I can't tell you specifically where, again, it, we need to just look more closely um, at the budget to determine that. Okay, thank you. So the next question goes to you first, Ms. Castellanos. What do you see as the board's roles and responsibilities? Can you outline them? You know, at the heart of it is to create and develop policy um, that supports our students and their uh, education and academic success um, from right, you know, uh, TK, early TK up through, um, through 12th grade and in some cases adult school and you know I think um, it's it's creating the policy that supports it looking at again making budget decisions uh, often very difficult but budget decisions to determine what serves that purpose um, best um, I can tell you that what it is not is to micromanage the 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 uh, the teaching and the learning and the administrating at the local level, but really supporting uh, administrators, teachers, and making sure that they have the resources um, and the support they need to be able to support our students effectively. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Franklin. Yeah, I see the role really is two part. And the first part is connecting with your community and to really understand the diverse needs of students, educators, families, um, community members, so that you're acting on the things that you're hearing from your community. And so as a representative, half, at least half of my job is being a listener and uh, working alongside community to then make some change, do some things. And the two biggest things the school board members are responsible for are hiring and firing the superintendent. And of course, there's a little bit more detail in, in terms of um, pushing there. Um, but also in, in deciding the budget, uh, we have a really robust process, I should say. We should should have a really robust process for what that budget looks like every year, but the school board members fiduciary responsibility is key. And so communicating with uh, community members to really make sure their priorities and their needs are reflected in the budget is that connection that school board members need to provide. That can happen through the local control accountability plan engagement process. It hasn't yet, um, but that's definitely something I want to work on right away when elected. Great. Um, so let's see. Uh, Ms. Franklin, you go first with this. Um, protests and BLM are currently in the news. How should LAUSD address the current unrest and events in the classroom? The classroom is a place for learning and we are learning right now in this moment. Um, it's important that we stand with our students, our family members, the, the movement of this country and not just say Black Lives Matter, but provide the space for students to grapple with what would that mean for our schools to change in curriculum and policy and community engagement so that it is not just a movement on the street, but it is really something that our students can feel deeply in their learning. I'm not afraid to say that we should stand with Black Lives Matter and we should make sure our dollars and our decisions reflect that. And so for me, I'm, I'm grateful for the question and I think we need to work alongside uh, lots of folks in figuring out what this looks like in practice. As a non-Black person myself, it's important to say that I, I would never, um, you know, have the voice of but need to work alongside uh, ensuring we um, reflect what that means in our teaching and learning. Um, and I know from experience that teaching is is absolutely a social justice act, just the very fact in being a classroom educator, um, and we can't shy away from that. We shouldn't. Okay, thank you. Ms. Castellanos. 
Um, yeah, I think if nothing more, I think it does show us that uh, learning happens outside of the classroom as well, right? And that we need to be able to bring those experiences of our students into the classroom and, you know, for, for many, like help them understand the realities that are happening around them. And I think we need to do more to encourage, um, you know, schools, teachers and administrators to engage their school community around these issues. This is an important issue. We need to, again, look at our curriculum, uh, look at how, you know, how our Black students are seeing themselves and their experiences reflected uh, in the curriculum, in our textbooks, or in this case, not reflected. And we need to be able to uh, engage, not just teach at them, but really bring those experiences into the classroom, their experiences into the, the classroom, and also learn along with them and create that community of learning uh, around social and racial justice issues in the classroom, on the school campus, uh, along with them. And, you know, um, yeah, I think we, we should have a culture of supporting our Black students and the, the protest and the Black Lives Matter movement. Hey, thank you. Okay, um, so this originally was supposed to go an hour and a half, and we're almost to the last question. So I'm going to ask uh, Pamela to look through the chat and see if there's any questions that she feels should be asked. And um, so she can do that. And so Ms. Castellanos, you're up next on the next question. So this is a good one. Do you have sufficient time and energy to devote to this position? How much time do you think it really takes? Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, uh, I think it takes a lot of time. Uh, I don't think it's a nine to five job. I am like coming into it with my eyes wide open. I have plenty of energy. I, um, you know, again, just given my, my career as an advocate and organizer, I don't think I've worked an eight hour day ever in my life. Um, and I don't expect to hear this is one of the most important roles, um, that that there is to fill one of the uh, I don't necessarily see it as a, a job necessarily, but a passion and a commitment. And this is one of the most important commitments I will make. Uh, and I, I expect to, you know, put in the hours that it takes to um, to do the, the job well and to represent the seventh district and the families of the seventh district well and make sure they have the services um, that they need and that, you know, LAUSD uh, supports their students in, in, in all the ways that, that are needed. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Franklin, what do you think? How are you going to tackle this? <laughs> yes, um, I have a long history of, of folks reflecting that I am super energetic. Maybe it's from my cheerleading background. Um, but I honestly think it's my, it's my work ethic because I care so deeply about this mission of educational equity and every kid deserving a great public school education. Um, it doesn't always feel like it's uh, a long day. It feels like this is how I want to spend my energy. And at the same time, as leaders, we can't model an unsustainable work culture. It's something I've been grappling with the older I get, and I can only anticipate um, having a, a family to take care of at home and needing to balance all of the, um, the various needs that that requires. Um, but in terms of my work ethic and prioritizing the students of this district, it is absolutely what I have done, what I will continue to do. And I don't think that should only be measured by hours in a day, though I will absolutely put them in, but really the results that we see with our students. And again, that's about setting really clear goals and measuring our progress towards those goals. I want people to hold me accountable to that. That's what will demonstrate if I have worked hard enough for our community. Okay, thank you. So, um, Ms. Uh, Franklin, you go first on this one. If elected, what would you hope would be key accomplishments of the board during your service? You know, I think the first one is to get really clear about what our mission is. I don't know if you have seen it anywhere in LA Unified. It might be buried in some, some documents, um, but we don't live our mission out, right? We're not clear, in my perspective, having worked in the district for nearly 15 years, that we have a big goal of every kid being prepared for college, career, and life, and being clear about what that means for every graduate in our district, particularly when graduation rates are at 80%, which is, you know, double what they were when I was in 
high school, um, but with half of our students ineligible for our public universities, that doesn't feel to me like we have a clear goal for students being prepared for the next uh, century of leadership as they will lead us into. So I think it is about getting clarity there and as well with our values. What will we not compromise on? You know, we use this word equity, which means we have to recognize the wrongs of the past and correct them with bold decisions around dollars and policy. And we need to do that in reality with this next budgeting cycle. And so that's definitely what I hope to accomplish in the first semester of being on the board. And I look forward to working with you all to do that. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Castellanos, what are your thoughts on that? What are your um, goals? What do you hope to accomplish before for your term? Um, there are a few things. Uh, one is we need to be able to, I want to be able to see that we have expanded the pie in terms of resources that we can invest in our students. And that happens in a number of different ways. One is, again, we need to be strong advocates at the federal and state level to make sure that we're bringing resources into our schools. I mean, you know, as mentioned in my opening remarks, we are near the bottom in per pupil spending at the state level. We need to change that. And so that is going to be a big fight that we all need to work on together. The, you know, the other way we get more resources is by expanding our partnerships with everyone, right, including our, our, you know, local cities and, you know, county agencies to make sure that we're not duplicating resources, but that we're leveraging the resources that exist to support our students and their families. And, and then as part of that, in creating a model of partnership is expanding the number of community schools and investing more in community schools so that we're bringing together into our neighborhood schools, our community partners, our community-based organizations, families, our local cities, to make sure that we're developing a strategic plan to, to leverage the assets, but also meet the needs of our, our school community and our families there. Okay, thank you. So next, you're up next for the next question. What do you see as the most significant challenge facing LAUSD today? Today, at this moment, the most significant challenge is, um, is, is developing a plan and really figuring out how we're going to reopen our school safety. Actually, it's a double challenge. One is making sure that we're uh, continuing and moving forward with uh, improving the distance learning that's happening for our students. I think we have made tremendous progress and we need to make sure that we're, we're continuing to do the work of supporting students and teachers in making that as effective as is possible, even if it's not the ideal uh, way for any, any student uh, to learn. Um, and then second part of that is opening our schools. And I know there are many outside forces that we have no control over. Uh, we need to make sure that our, our numbers are low enough and that it's safe for us to open, but we need to make sure that we have the, the resources and the right protocols in place to open safely for, uh, for students, uh, teachers, administrators, and all staff on campus. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Franklin, you'll take this one, then Pamela is going to give us an audience question. Super fun. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Franklin. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge for LA Unified, but also for our country in this moment, is racism. It's white supremacy. And that shows up in the public health crisis we're dealing with, in the disparate uh, learning opportunities our kids are experiencing, not only during distance learning, but prior to the pandemic. You know, it is at least 400 years in this country that we have not reckoned with centering those who have been most historically pushed to the side. And that shows up in so many decisions that are made, in how um, we purchase curriculum, in how we engage with our families, in how we do our budgeting process and allocate our resources. You know, we're decision makers, elected officials are still so often moved by the power of dollars and whiteness in this country. And we absolutely have to say that LA Unified will not be that way any longer, that we not only recognize the harms of the past, but we take action to be anti-racist in LA Unified in every way possible. And yes, that is the public health concern, but that is way beyond beyond this current moment we're in. We have a legacy to leave to our kids. And for me, it is absolutely about racial justice in our public schools. Okay, thank you. And now Pamela has a question from the audience. Yes. Go ahead. Bear with me one moment. 
We have several of them that are quite good, Athena. Okay, so. well, we have about 10 minutes and then we have to go to closing remarks, something like that. So we have time to, for like three questions. Okay, so I'm taking them in order um, that I see them in the chat. Okay. Okay, so are you willing to work to fully defund, I think they mean the um, LA USD police? Active shooters are not just fear to just a fear to maintain the department costs millions of dollars should be directed to funding psw counselors and care for students to build community and safety so this is a statement that was made in the chat box can each candidate speak to that right so um ms franklin you would go first Thanks for the question. Um, you know, there are a couple of things I need to understand better before saying 100% abolition of LA school police. And part of it is the budget. I have heard this and would need to maintain my fiduciary responsibility that if we depleted the LA school police force in one year, we would be responsible for $500 million in their pensions. And that is clearly irresponsible and not centering our students. So that's one thing I need to look into. The second is that I am very nervous about ever partnering with the sheriff's department or LAPD, particularly in this moment. They are not being responsive to communities of color in ways that I am confident would protect our students, regardless of what the issue is. And so I would need to understand in the very, very rare instance in which there is something that only a law enforcement officer would be able to respond to, what would we do in LA Unified? And like I said, LA sheriffs and, and LAPD would not be my go-to in this moment. Um, so once I understand those two things, I definitely want to get to a place, um, of course, where we fund mental health and social emotional supports, counselors and campus aides, all of the preventative work that has to go into creating school safety. Absolutely, we have to put our resources there. Okay, thank you. Ms. Castellanos? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to look really carefully and work with you know, our, our school community to identify what the right strategies um, are to what the right strategies are to employ to ensure uh, safety, right? And I, I completely agree. We need to invest. We need to find resources to invest in the the most important needs for our students, and that is what I'm hearing now. But also pre-COVID, we need more mental health supports. Uh, we need uh, more counselors. We need to continue to invest in that and find money in the budget. Uh, for that. Aside from that, we really need to work with our school communities to find out in terms of student safety, we need to assure that mental uh, safety, uh, physical safety and emotional safety. And then separate from that, we need to look at what are the necessary, absolutely necessary law enforcement functions and what is an alternative to the school police? Is there an alternative to school police? I agree. I do not want our uh, local city or county police in our schools. They do not have the experience to work with our students. Um, and so I would avoid that at all, at, at, in any way possible, but I do need to make sure, I would want to ensure that we have the safety of everyone in mind. Okay, thank you. And so the next question, Pam, um, Ms. Castellanos, you're gonna go first. Okay. When budget cuts come, the arts are the first to go. However, the best performing schools have enriched arts education programs. How can LAUSD provide an enriched curriculum and extracurricular programs that afford students opportunity to gauge, engage with the arts? You know, first of all, because so much of our, our funding is tied to enrollment, I think, um, letting the world know how uh, how important these programs are, but also how successful they are at the schools that they do exist. We need to find ways to increase enrollment at our schools and even expand arts program because that is um, that is a program that so many families are hungry for. And so I, I, I actually believe that by expanding the programs, we're going to be able to attract more families to our schools. And so we need to um, find ways to do that. I think the other um, essential element of that to, to my 
earlier point is we need to partner with other uh, both agencies, but also nonprofits that provide arts, arts curriculum so that we can actually leverage those resources and use their expertise and experience to provide that programming to our students. Thank you. And Ms. Franklin? I agree resources are a big issue and so I hope everyone will vote yes on Prop 15 so LA Unified can get more resources overall. And we have to think really differently about how we have invested in the arts in LA Unified. So for example, there are elementary arts itinerant instructors that currently still need the classroom teacher to be with students, which is a budgeting challenge for schools that would like to have additional services for their students, but might not be able to provide additional dollars for, for staff members. We have this equity index in the district for arts separate from the student equity needs index mentioned earlier, that's supposed to give community partners partnerships to schools that have historically not had the resources or, or don't in their neighborhoods. We actually have to use that, right? And so similar to the general argument about budgeting, we can't only rely on adequacy. We also have to think about equity. And we know that for so many kids, the arts are not only motivating for an extracurricular, but are very foundational to their creation, to their, their collaboration and problem solving. And we have to think about direct instruction, integration, and access to this is the arts capital of the world, right? We are the entertainment capital here in Los Angeles. There's no reason we can't get the resources from community and business and industry to partner with our schools. True, thank you. Uh, so Pamela, we have time for one more from the audience. Do you have one more? I do. Great. Okay. LA County Department of Public Health has said that it's safe to reopen schools for small groups of English learners and kids with special needs. But so far, UTLA has opposed that. Where do you stand? Who should determine whether it's safe? And Ms. Franklin, you'll go first with that one. Thanks for the question. Absolutely, public health should determine that it's safe, and they have for small groups, and yet we are partway through the semester, and planning for reorganizing a matrix is really challenging. That said, I have talked to so many classroom teachers and parents who said they would be willing to have their students come on campus in small groups, particularly English language learners and special education students, but it has to be voluntary and it can't be top down from the district to make the best decisions for kids in this moment. You know, there was a survey done this summer, it was anonymous and so it didn't provide the opportunity to match students willing to come on campus with teachers coming willing to come on campus. And that's really hard to to adjust midway through the year, but we should be planning for that for next semester, absolutely, if not before. And like I said, I know there are so many folks who are willing, assuming we figure out all of the appropriate protocols and practice those protocols. And if we truly centered our students with the highest needs, we would figure out this plan sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Castellanos. Yes, um, so the County Department of Public Health uh, did say it's safe or is allowing it um, so long as the proper protocols and practices are able to be in place at the school. Uh, I think there is a question about whether um, every school at LAUSD is equipped to do that. Um, I think I, I absolutely recognize the need of, of students uh, special need and English language learners. And I agree, we have to be able to plan for that, but we need to make sure that the, the teachers, um, teachers aid, special uh, ed teachers and aides, as well as um, you know the other support staff, feel safe and comfortable. I mean, this is a time of such uncertainty and the, the, you know, the health crisis, unlike any other that we've experienced. And we're hearing from workers across multiple sectors that are being forced to go into work. Many are choosing not to because they don't feel safe. And many feel like they don't have a choice and are going to work and not feeling safe. And, you know, again, we have to remember that um, the families that are sending their kids to our communities, a lot of them are in those parts of the county that have the highest numbers of, of uh, in COVID infection. And so there we need to ensure that first and foremost, it is safe. And I, I think that's that will that's what will lead from uh, schools to school, whether and when we open. 
Okay, thank you. And Pam, do you have one more? We do have time. Oops, you're muted. Okay, so I don't know if this is something you know about, but it says a lawsuit was filed yesterday by families who said that the terms of distance learning at LAUSD discriminates against black and Latino students, kids with special needs, low income students, English learners. Um, what do the candidates think about this lawsuit or are you aware of that? Okay, so Ms. Castellanos, you go first. I, I am aware of the lawsuit only through news reports. I actually, I have not yet actually uh, read it, so don't know the details of it. Um, some of the information that I, I hear from reading the paper, I think there are some uh, elements and some of the concerns that parents have that are absolutely valid. My hope is that LAUSD responds quickly to them uh, and addresses those concerns uh, before, um, you know, without having to wait the the long time that a legal case and the legal process takes. So, you know, there were things such that I read, such as the translation of materials for parents, um, parents really being at a loss or wanting more support and being able to support their students to, through distance learning. As I mentioned earlier, I think we can provide more support training for parents to be able to do that. And so I, my hope is that the district can address those concerns immediately uh, because those are urgent needs for our students and for those students that and they should not have to wait for relief uh, on those uh, needs and concerns. Thank you. And Ms. Franklin, what do you think? Yeah, you know, a lawsuit signals to me that there has not been clear communication that is problem solved in the ways that meets the needs of those most impacted by the situation. And so I anticipated through, you know, months of families complaining that their students weren't getting what they felt they deserved, that it was only a matter of time before we, LA Unified, I should say, um, was sued for helping to meet the needs of students, whether that was special education lawsuits, which there are already a proliferation of, um, or in particular, a, a racial justice suit around access to um, equal opportunity of education. And so there are some things in the suit about instructional minutes that I think require a bit more examination, but ultimately it is about making sure that kids are um, mitigating the learning loss, catching up where possible. And, and I don't know that extending the school day right now or Saturdays of learning time for those who are farthest behind is the best solution. But the suit does call for some really specific remedies to help meet the needs of the, the plaintiffs in this case. Um, ultimately, I agree that we need to try to meet the needs of students more quickly than a lawsuit ever could. Um, but I do thank the parents for raising their voice. Okay. Well, sadly, we've come to the end of our questions. We could go all night, I'm sure, but the interest, uh, in the interest of closing our session in an hour and a half, we're now going to move to our closing remarks. And because we started with candidate one, which was Ms. Castellanos, we're now going to start with Ms. Franklin in her closing remarks, and it's all yours. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. It was so great to see the participant numbers continue to go up. Thank you for submitting questions, for participating. You know, voters in District 7 have a really important choice to make in the next five weeks that will contribute to big decisions about public education over the, at least the next four years, potentially eight or 12, as I would love to be able to serve. Um, big questions like if and how we return to campus, uh, how we budget for our priorities, how we work together for racial justice, and deeply how we prepare the next generation of student leaders. You know, I'm running and I hope to earn your support because I have a vision that centers our most historically marginalized children through ongoing community engagement, just like this, except I would also get to listen and not just talk. Um, and one that fairly resources our, our budget for our kids um, and for our shared future, honestly. You know, we're living in a moment that demands we not just say Black Lives Matter, no human is illegal, love is love and climate change is real. But we have to put our dollars and our decisions toward those statements with real action. And that's absolutely what I hope to do as your next board member. And I invite you all to hold me accountable to that continuously. 
I know that as an education leader, I'm only as effective as my relationships are strong with those closest to kids and classrooms. So our teachers, our parents, our community members, our school staff members. And I'm asking for your vote because I know that together, we absolutely can ensure that every child is prepared for college, career, and the life that they want to live. LA Unified can be a world-class education if we focus on our kids together. I hope to not only earn your support in this election, but to continuously earn your trust and your partnership as the next board member for District 7. Please vote if you are eligible. Please complete the census if you have not yet and encourage others to do so as well. Thank you so much for tonight. Thank you. And Ms. Castellanos, your two minutes. Okay, um, again, thank you uh, to our hosts the, this evening for putting together this candidate forum. I think this is uh, you know, valuable information for voters in the district um, to have and as, a, as their decision-making process come November 3rd. I also wanna thank everyone in the audience for taking some time out of your Saturday um, to, to join us and hear about this race that is so critical and important. Um, there is a lot at stake November 3rd from the White House to the school board. We need to make sure that we're electing leaders that are willing to stand up for our children and our families. And I have a long track record spanning more than 30 years or close to 30 years uh, of fighting uh, for our children. As a public servant, advocate and organizer, I have the proven experience of bringing people together, of understanding their issues and working together to fight for progressive and positive policies at every level of government and to make sure that those policies are implemented to have concrete impact and have concretely improved the lives of our children and their families. And that's the experience that I want to bring to the school board. And I would be honored to serve you. And, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, I have broad support. I have the, the support of the teachers uh, LA Unified School Teachers of Education Workers United, Mayor Garcetti, but also have the experience, the support of, of other leaders who have seen my experience firsthand. And I know that they will work with us to make sure that our students are getting everything they can. And that includes County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Um, it includes Assembly Member Mike Gibson. It includes our outgoing uh, LAUSD school board member, Dr. Vladovic, and I want to bring that expertise and those relationships to improve the quality of learning and the achievement for our students. And so with that, I hope that I can count on your support and yes, please vote. Uh, whether it's as soon as you get your ballot put in the mail, there are going to be many opportunities for you to go, but it is so, this race is so critical and this election is so critical. And so um, looking forward to, um, to working with all of you. Hey, thank you very much. So usually if we'd be in a big room, there'd be applause. And so I'm your crowd. Woo! Good job. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you to all you who participated in the chat room. Couldn't believe, I think that's the most chats I've seen in any of these forums. My God, you're talkative. That's awesome. Anyway, I just want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank also the YWCA, which I totally forgot to thank, and, and their great organization, and for all the uh, volunteers from the league. I don't know if I said my name's Athena Paquette. And um, so I also want to thank Monica Fredericks, who put this all together, chased you down, and forced you to do this. So thank you, Monica, for all the organizing you did. She is our voter service chair and has been very busy, busy, busy. So thank you all for attending. Just as a reminder, we will have this video ready. The candidates will receive it in a couple of days. And, um, and all the candidates' information will be in the outro. And if you haven't thought of it, you might want to join the League of Women Voters or donate so we can continue doing all the great things we do. And that is it. Thank you for coming, everybody. Have a great evening. And oh, City of Carson is tomorrow. If any of you live in City of Carson, tomorrow the City Council and the mayoral race uh, is happening. So we have a, it should have been on the flyer, but if not, contact Monica or go to our website. And uh, we hope to see you there tomorrow. Thank you for coming. Good night.